So did you know James before you uh, did a podcast with him? Do you guys do you guys have any history, or did was that the first time you really met him? Yeah. So no, I met James a long time before I did the oh, okay. podcast with him. Just uh, he was actually doing a, a talk. This is way before James. I think James had about sixteen thousand followers when I first met him. Okay. And um, he was talking at Body Power Expo, and a girl that I know there was like, "Look, come and listen to this guy chat." And I went into this hall and sat down at the back, and he must have had about hundred hundred people there. And I sat and had a watched him. I just messaged him after the sh after he finished and just said, "Bro, like, I really enjoyed, you know, your talk because he's he's such a funny guy, and the, the points he was getting across were great, but in a very easy format." Totally, yeah. And then it was about six, I guess, six months after that point. Like he messaged back, said, "Cool, man, thank you." Um, he was in Ibiza and I was in Ibiza, and both our followers were like. You and you and James need to hang out, and we ended up meeting up in Ibiza, had a night out, and then the rest is history. We've been good friends since. Oh, very cool. I'm trying to remember when you I first linked up with you too. I shit, I think I found 2018. you. 2018. It was a while ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it was I, a Sunday. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't. Re, I don't I even remember. I do you remember what it was? I don't know. I saw. I don't know if I saw a video or something you were talking about, and I just liked the content that you were putting out. And I think at that time I was looking for somebody in in the the Olympic lifting uh, space that I thought was putting out really good information, and I began following you after that. And then since then we've been kind of bouncing back and forth trying to get you on the show. So I'm excited, dude! Excited to have you here. Thank you. Um, yeah, you came a long way, man. Yeah. Oh, I've been pinballing the world at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Denver. Uh, I saw your stop in Denver looked fucking brutal. Did you see his video? No. Oh yeah, it looked nasty. There. I've just been in Banff, and I was like, right, this place is cold. And then got off at Denver. I was like, whoa, next level. <laughs> they made us walk off the plane. I was like, I'm gonna freeze before I get. They were to like the spraying. Look, like they probably spraying the plane with hot water or whatever like that. To, yeah, it was so cool. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you're in San Jose now. <laughs> Not too cold out here. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so we wanted to talk to you about Olympic lifting um, as it relates to the average fitness kind of health, fit, health and fitness consumer. Now, we've been in fitness for a long time, and Olympic lifting, nobody did it outside of actual Olympic lifters. Then CrossFit came along and popularized some of the lifts. And as a, uh, being a trainer, uh, I, you know, I understood the value of, of Olympic lifts. I also understand the complexity of Olympic lifting. And one thing that always stood out to me was, you know, if you took like a power lifter and a bodybuilder and Olympic lifter and you had them perform athletic uh, endeavors, the Olympic lifters always seem to be just phenomenally athletic. It just has this, it's a very functional type of strength and ability. Um, and so I think there's a lot of value for that kind of training, but I think you also, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, need to approach it with uh, a high level of caution and, and make sure that you do things uh, properly. For the people who may not be quite aware, what exactly is Olympic lifting? What does it consist of? What does it look like? What makes it different? Yeah, so Olympic weightlifting is made up of the two competitive movements, which are the snatch and the clean and jerk. And then as you've mentioned, I think through, there's various different exercises and stuff that we'll use in terms of the train to develop our ability in Olympic weightlifting. But then there's much simpler movements like the power snatches and the power cleans, which you'll see more commonly used in any sports that are looking to improve power output or in CrossFit and more simple movement of the, the snatch and the clean jerk and using a competitive format too. Okay, now you, you said power. Okay, what's the difference between power and strength. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we have listeners right now who hear the two and think of them as being interchangeable. And it doesn't help that power lifting is called power lifting, <laughs> exactly. even though they don't, that's not, a, they're, not they're, they're showing strength and power. <laughs> what is the difference between power and strength and how do they, how do they work with each other? Yeah. So for me, it's like exactly like you said with, with power lifting, power lifting should be called strength lifting and Olympic lifting should be the one that's referred to as the powerful movement, because obviously we're producing the speed element of Olympic weightlifting that makes it a hell of a lot more powerful than powerlifting. So for me, with the exercises that you'll have in Olympic weightlifting, they do say that it's one of the fastest movements in in sport in terms of the snatch and how quickly it's executed. So that's the powerful element of the Olympic lift for sure. So strength would be I'm lifting something heavy. Slowly. Power would be I can lift something quickly yeah, and explosively. Yeah. Now, how, how would the average person, how do you think the average person would benefit from from that? Why, why would somebody even want to develop any level of power? Or, you know, let's take a step back. Does getting stronger automatically contribute to more power? 
No, not necessarily, because this is this is the thing where when you say you start comparing bodybuilders or um, powerlifters against Olympic weightlifters, you can be extremely strong and have an incredible um, back squat or front squat or deadlift and that not carry over into the Olympic movements. Mm. And I think one of the biggest reasons why that doesn't necessarily happen is because of the flexibility and mobility required mm -hmm. in the Olympic lifts as well, which mm -hmm. is why, you know, you can put me up against, say, you know, Bass, for example, Sebastian, and look at the numbers he's moving, but we've tried many a times to get him to do the Olympic movements and he, he can't get it going anywhere. And this, because we've got need to produce a lot more force over a short distance of time. So that being said, what are some of the prerequisites that you look for or you tell some, so someone walks in the street and they're like, okay, this sounds great. Olympic lifting sounds like something I should be doing or should consider. What are some of the things that you're telling them they need to do first? Or what are you looking at as a coach? Yeah, so the first thing for me before when someone's getting into Olympic weightlifting, I'm looking at how that they can move. Mm -hmm. So I'll do with any of my guys that I'm coaching or even online, they have to complete a fundamental movement package, if you like, first before I'll even think about sticking a bar in their hands. And this is one of the biggest things with Olympic weightlifting. People get in and they go straight to pick up the bar and go, right, let's learn how to Olympic lift. Mm. Whereas they miss that huge and most important bit, like I've mentioned about moving well first before even thinking about touching a barbell. So sometimes I can spend up to two, three weeks with an athlete or with someone that's come in the door and gone, on an Olympic weightlift, Sunny, teach me, just trying to get them to be aware of their body and get in all the positions that we need to be in when we're Olympic weightlifting for it to be most efficient. And only then do I go and stick a bar in the hand and start teaching them how to do an overhead squat, for example. Now, what are some of the movements that you'll look at and have them do? Like, are you doing, having them do like a squat assessment? Are you having them do, yeah, looking at wrist mobility? What are the things that you that you'll look at what yes. movements. Yeah, so one of the key things is obviously overhead mobility and upper thoracic mobility. So mm. that's bringing hands up and behind the headline. That would be a huge thing that we'd look at. And then obviously squat mobility. To be most efficient in the Olympic lifts, you need to be able to sit as deep as possible in a strong and upright position. So those would be my key areas. And then in terms of specific areas that need to have the mobility, it's going to be ankles, hips, upper thoracics, and shoulders. Mm. What do you see most of the issues when someone comes in and wants to work with you? Where do you typically say, okay, this is a common one I need to work on? Is it the uh, thoracic? Um, thoracic's one, but that generally comes to, you can have people that come in from a sporting background that have done, you know, the bench press, et cetera, and they're very tight in the upper back there, and that will restrict them. But I'd say more commonly, hips. Mm. You know, for not many people, although like in a sport specific background like CrossFit, weightlifting, you will see people doing full range of squats, but the general public out there will not know what a full squat looks like. Same thing we see when we yeah. would train people in Now, gym. do you think yeah. that because also you're, you're allowed to wear um, like lifted shoes, right? So it mm -hmm. kind of like supports that if you have not the most ideal ankle mobility, you can kind of get away with a little bit more that way. Yeah, well, for sure. When that's one of the most popular questions that people ask is like, is it worth getting Olympic weightlifting shoes when you start out? And for me, weightlifting shoes are far more important if you're a beginner than they are for an expert because mm. they do give you that level of stability. Um, and with the raised heel, obviously means that the ankle doesn't have to be as mobile as it would do in flat shoes. So I'll always recommend it for people. But with there always being new shoes bought out, people always go for that quick fix. They're like, okay, I'm going to get the latest lifting shoes and I'm all of a sudden going to have amazing mobility and be able to do a great score. As we do, it's like in any sport, a new golf club comes out. You're like, oh, yeah, that's going to help me hit it <laughs> 10 right. yards further. It's that quick fix, you know, what? and it doesn't, you can't do that with mobility. Where, where would you rank in terms of complexity? I know where I would rank it, but I would like to hear from you. Where, where would you rank in terms of complexity of, of all the resistance training modalities, right? Powerlifting, bodybuilding, and all the different types of exercises. And then you have Olympic lifting. Where would you rank it in terms of complexity and skill level or skill needed? W it, would you rank Olympic lifting at the top in terms of just because of the speed and the form needed? Yeah, I think f for sure looking from an outsider's point of view in at Olympic way, if then you go, even just watching it, you go, that's obviously the most complex yeah. one. But as I've spent time working with 
powerlifters, working with bodybuilders, just to broaden my understanding of how they train. There's also a huge element of complexity in the technique behind those movements as well, which for the average viewer, they wouldn't recognize that. Mm. So I'd say there's, there's the elements of technique for all of them, but I think because of the time taken for the Olympic lift to happen, it being so short, it is probably the most common. Oh, with that and the, the, the joint mobility required for Olympic lifting, yeah, right. right? You can get away as a power lifter and a bodybuilder and, and do half reps and shorten range of motion on many moves. Obviously, if you're power lifting, you have to at least break the 90 in a squat to get the lights, right? But uh, other than that, you could get away with a uh, shorter range of motion where Olympic lifting, I mean, uh, to me, that's the real complexity of it is that it requires really good joint mm. mobility that I find, or at least I found training clients for decades. Those, the average person that walked in the gym just didn't have that. And I'd mm -hmm. spend uh, months, uh, sometimes longer trying to get them to be able to take a joint through full range of motion, much less, teach a complex movement yeah. like Olympic. I look at it as like the pinnacle of, uh, you know, generating power, but also like the, you know, stability element has to be there too. So you have to be able to move incredibly well, incredibly fast and be able to stabilize it all at the same time. So, you know, those three things, if, have you worked with a bodybuilder and a power lifter and, uh, how would you say like they differ in terms of like trying to then teach them an Olympic lift? Like what are some of the barriers there? Yeah, well, I think um, just going back, like you said, around, you know, getting them to, to move well first and have that stability element. And this is one of the biggest things for me when it comes to mobilizing for Olympic weightlifting is you can be mobile and be flexible, but then we need for Olympic weightlifting need to be mobile under load. Yeah. And therefore, that's one of my biggest approaches in the way that I'm mobilized for Olympic weightlifting is you have to do the exercises under element of load or a much higher level of resistance than what you would get doing a, a static stretch necessarily, mm -hmm. which is why for me using exercises like SOTS press, doing the actual overhead squat is the best way to actually improve that. So people come to me and they go, Sonny, you know, I, I can't do an overhead squat. I can't break parallel. And nine times out of 10, I'm actually asking them just to work through the range they can, even just with a little bit of load. And then over a period of time, you're able to get lower and lower into that position without doing any magical exercise. It just takes time actually going through that range that you've got and then go, okay, I can go a little bit lower this time. But what happens is people go, right, this is my level of range that I've got. And then they go, right, I'm just going to start stacking on more weight. And that range gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Whereas I always say to my guys, right, let's do this with a 20 kilo bar. Mm. Until you've got a full range, we don't go any heavier than the, full, the 20 kilo bar. And then you end up developing the strength and stability through the full range rather than someone gets to, you know, they can power snatch 40 kilos and then they go for 50 and all of a sudden they get pushed into a compromising position mm. that results in them hurting themselves. And this is one of mm -hmm. the biggest things why you see so many injuries in Olympic weightlifting because people are dropping into positions that they haven't got that stability and strength mm. in first. So I'm curious and then because there's uh, mobility has become such a buzz term in the last decade in our space and up has popped all these different certifications and techniques and there's different camps on, you know, what is the best way to increase mobility uh, what do you think about things like, are you familiar with FRC or Ken Stretch, Aldoa? Are you familiar with some of those? No, not, not completely. Okay, so and I know you said you wrote like a mobility course, correct? Okay. Now, are all the exercises, are they all done with like load and challenging range of motion? Or do you have some body weight movements that you're doing and you try and intensify? Some what, isometrics. Yeah, area. what what does some of it look like? Yeah, so for me, like the exercises that wouldn't be in so intense is what I'd like to call glides. So I'm starting to work on, for example, the knee tracking over the toe mm. in the bottom position, okay? But I'm not necessarily in my squat. I may just be putting weight on top of my knee and working on tracking knee over toe. So that's what I would refer to as more of a glide and would be a low intensity movement. Just getting the body used to moving into the range that we're gonna want it to do with 100 kilos eventually. And then the more intense ones would be sports specific, like I said, the overhead squats, the SOTS press, which I'd say is extremely complex for a lot of people to do. That again is then starting to build that um, stability overhead through that range. You mentioned uh, time, you know, how it takes time, which 100% uh, completely agree. And when I think of 
you know, resistance training exercises, I can, I can rank them in terms of risk versus reward. And oftentimes, some exercises have, uh, they're very safe when done properly, but if you move them outside of improper form by one or two degrees, they become very dangerous. And other exercises, that may not be the case. For example, a dumbbell curl, I can be off, my form can be off by 10%. I'm probably not going to hurt myself. But I, not- I noticed with Olympic lifts, if you're off by 10%, your risk of injury is extremely high, which is probably, wh- but if you do it right, it's not dangerous, right? Which is probably why it takes so much time or you want to take your time. When you get a new person coming in, no experience Olympic lifting, otherwise healthy, right? How long typically do you take? does it take before you have this person do uh, Olympic lifts with decent load? How long does that, does that process look like? And be totally honest. Yeah, it, it depends what we call decent. I'd definitely say age would come into okay. a, a huge factor of it in terms of what I'd be looking them to achieve. Well, how long would you take them before they do Olympic lifts with just the bar? No experience before you have them do stuff with the bar full Olympic lifts? Um, if the, I'd say if they had bad mobility and couldn't get into positions, which I think you're referring to, I would say it would take nearly a month before, for them to be closer to producing a good movement pattern with a snatch and a clean and jerk. Mm-hmm. But one of the biggest things with this is as well as how often are you practicing? And for me, when you're Frequency. learning Olympic weightlifting, yeah. To begin with, it needs to be at least three times a week to actually start developing a consistent movement pattern. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you're going in in your Olympic lifting, you're standing over the bar and every lift looks different. (laughs) And it's hard to actually develop any consistency, stability through any range if the movement's not consistent a lot. So that's why there is that need to really have a coach when you're starting Olympic weightlifting or at least have someone that's consistently watching what you're doing so that you're getting enough feedback to know, okay, this is in the position that I need to be in. Now, do you have a sort of a ritual that you teach, uh, you know, somebody coming up, even just to approach the bar, you know, the grip, like where you stand, like that whole process so they can try and duplicate it as, as best as possible? Yeah. Well, you said, you said process there and that that's the key thing for me. Um, and I think with Olympic weightlifting in general, that psychological side of it is a huge factor that people struggle with that Mm. it isn't necessarily talked about. And one of the best ways for me, not only to develop the consistency, but to overcome that psychological aspect of if I miss this weight, it's going to hurt me. Or Mm. if I don't get this, uh, I miss my PB, et cetera, is having the process. So for me, that's a huge part when I'm working with the beginner. It's having what I like to call think box and play box. And I learned that when I was playing golf. And I step back behind the bar and this is where I'm focusing on the technical cues of what my coach or, you know, what I'm trying to execute on that session, which may be, for example, staying on flat feet or keeping the bar closer through the middle. So I do all my thinking in the think box. Hmm. Once I step out of my think box, the process begins and everyone will have their own things that they'll do in their process, whether it's a flick of their hair, whether it's an adjustment of their shorts, but that's part of the process. So I'll always grip right hand first, then left hand, and then I get my feet set. And then as I step over the bar and I, which, you know, a lot of beginners will, you guys will know this is feeling as well. And you go, oh God, this is going to be heavy sort of moment. (laughs) What I do then is I count myself in. So I go five, four, three, two, one. And just purely by thinking about counting, I distract myself from thinking about those negative thoughts or the things that are going to prevent me from executing the process well. Mm. And then when I get to one, I just go. And that way, always having that routine and then I make the lift and I put the bar down and I step back and I go again, I'm starting to develop a consistent routine on getting into my setup position. Yeah, something you said just a few minutes ago, I thought that was Mm. uh, very interesting is, you know, when you're practicing and you're learning, in the beginning especially, every lift looks different. And I totally know what that feels like. I've, I've tried practicing certain, you know, very rudimentary beginner type Olympic lifts, not even the actual Olympic lifts themselves. I know exactly what that feels like. It's like I do one and I watch the next one. It's like that didn't look like this first one and I have to practice over and over again. What role does fatigue play in that? In other words, are you letting people, especially when you're teaching them Olympic lifts, are you pushing them to fatigue or is that like a no-no because when fatigue sets in, I know with other lifts, form tends to go out the window. Yeah. And 
again, I think when people think, right, I'm going to practice my Olympic weightlifting today, they think, right, let's go light, let's go with an empty bar and let's do lo lots of repetitions. But if you're doing sets of maybe five reps with a bar, by set three or four, you're fatigued and therefore you're not going to be executing the same technique. And you said just with the bar. Yeah, of course. And this is the thing for me and something that when I'm working on my technique with my coach, so when we're coming out of like a strength block and now we're working in transition into develop it, turning that strength into strength technique phase, we're doing maybe 10 sets of one rep working on my technique at 70 to 80%, which is more relative to where I'm going to be working at when I'm going towards a maximal lift, as opposed to doing five sets of five at 40, 50% of my best and just drilling it. This is so important because with, with other resistance training modalities, uh, fatigue is a part of the programming. Like if I'm doing bodybuilding style training and I'm going to go work out, I'm trying to get some, 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 somewhat fatigued. I'm trying to feel the muscles burn. I'm trying to get a pump, especially as it become more advanced. With Olympic lifting, it's a different mentality, right? It's a totally different mentality. Yeah, that's it. So we don't want to be ever practicing technique under fatigue. I think in the strength movements that we'll be doing for Olympic weightlifting, i.e. the squats, the pulls, yes, then we can work When you're doing towards, the traditional stuff. Yeah, yeah, more traditional compound movements, we can work towards fatigue. But when we're working technique for Olympic weightlifting, you want to be thinking low repetition. Explode. And, yeah, and explode closer to those working percentages that you would be doing during your normal training program. And I think that's a big mistake a lot of people do or for beginners getting into the sport is where they deemed technical practice should take place. So you must, it must be like nails on a chalkboard for you to watch a CrossFit wad where people are doing Olympic lifts in circuits to fatigue. I mean, and then sprinting outside. Yeah, how did, like, is that something that when you look at that, are you just going, wow, what is going on? Or do you consider that a completely different sport because if you, if you did consider Olympic lifting, it would be like that for you. That's, that's a great question. And for me, CrossFit has been a huge part of my role in Olympic weightlifting. You know, I started weightlifting in 2005 or 2004 where CrossFit wasn't really a big thing. Um, and I've seen the sort of sport develop far beyond weightlifting. And then I've seen weightlifting become a part of CrossFit. And, you know, without CrossFit for me, I wouldn't really have a job. Um, so I think where whereas a lot of weightlifters when CrossFit came about were like, what is this sport? They're doing terrible practice of the Olympic movements. I was like, okay, now here's an opportunity for me to actually mm. educate the market. And like, you can't expect, if you come in and you've never done gymnastics before, right? And you have six months experience in gymnastics. I guarantee if a gymnast come in and had a look at your technique on a triple backflip, they'd be like, it's terrible. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So people forget that how long it takes to actually have good technique um, in any sport practice. So putting that aside and going, right, it's going to take at least a year, two years before people are going to be executing the weightlifting in a good movement pattern and actually going, right, let's be patient with these guys and get them moving well first. So for me, if you're looking at a movement that a CrossFit would do, i.e. barbell cycling, that is a completely different technique that you would use to do a heavy 1RM. And you do have to, have to separate those two movements when you're watching Matt Fraser or Eddie Hall just doing grace or whatever he did as fast as he can, which is ultimately just like a reverse curl versus a 1RM, 1RM lift. But what I always say to the CrossFit guys, and that's why you see the, the best CrossFitters in the world, the likes of Matt Fraser and Noah Olsen dominating the sport, is because they learned how to execute a 1RM heavy snatch first before they learn how to cycle the barbell. Mm. And the reason why is because they develop an understanding of where that bar should be in relation to the body first. Explain what you mean by cycle, cycle the barbell. So cycling the barbell would be multiple repetitions as, as fast mm -hmm. as um, as fast as you can go. So the th sort of focus when you're cycling a barbell, you may be bouncing the bar off the floor to gain the momentum to go into the next lift. You tend to turn over, which is quite hard to explain, the bar from the top right down to the floor as opposed to dumping it and resetting. Mm. So it, re it requires a completely so different you're kind of pushing it down. Yeah, you're down. pushing it down, going for speed. Technique does break down under fatigue. It's not, it's not, there's almost two different things. And I think, like you said, you do have to separate mm. that. So sure. when you saw this, you thought, oh, this is an opportunity. And did you go in and start coaching and training CrossFitters how to train 
more like an Olympic lifter in order to give them, you know, some advantages? Yeah, I think there was a lot of receptive people in the CrossFit community <clears throat> understanding the fact that, okay, this is a really technical element of what we need to do. The people that are teaching us CrossFit won't have a deep understanding on how to coach Olympic weightlifting. And they started to draw people weightlifters in mm. um, and that's where I came in and it wasn't just about necessarily teaching the CrossFit community how to weightlift correctly but also help the coaching market out and go this is the process of what you need to be doing with your guys when they first start out and that would be like the main thing that I would love to change in CrossFit would be you remember when there was like an on-ramp course I don't know if you're aware of that but it's like a it was like a step-by-step -step things that athletes had to do first before they could join into a CrossFit class. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I would love to there to that still be a ma major thing that if you walk into the door at my CrossFit gym, okay, you need to do five, six PT sessions with an Olympic weightlifting coach. You need to do the same with a uh, gymnast coach before you're allowed to join. Some sort of prerequisite. Class. Yeah, because, you know, weightlift, CrossFit gets more people in the door to learn Olympic weightlifting than Olympic weightlifting does. Oh, for 100%. Sure. 100%. Yeah. I, I managed gyms for <laughs> for two decades, and the squat, just the squat rack, forget Olympic lifting, the squat rack would have dust on it. I'd manage a 40,000-square-foot gym. It would have one squat rack, first of all, because nobody cared about squatting, and then the squat yeah. rack was always completely empty. Well, I imagine, too, it's even difficult to just teach your average person triple extension. Like, do you have a hard time with that, or is that pretty easy? But again, triple extension, explain it. It's it's such a it's such a complex thing. And this is like again for me why I think I've been successful in the teaching of Olympic weight of thing in the CrossFit market is because I make it a lot much simpler than that. Mm. And although Tell I me how could, you do that. Yeah, of course you can, you know, bore someone to death with break force kinematics, bar path analysis <laughs> of Olympic weight of thing, but <laughs> they come in the door, they're gonna go, Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, see you next week, you know, they're gonna be straight out. Whereas my process of teaching people Olympic weightlifting is to get them to do stuff they already know how to do. So once you've got someone in the correct start position, my focus is on getting them to think about jumping. When they jump, they squeeze their glutes, mm -hmm. their legs hit full extension, and they rise up onto their toe. Mm -hmm. All things I'd want them to do when they're snatching. Mm. But when someone goes jump, you go, yeah, Sonny, I know how to do that, no problem, bang. And all of a sudden, you've got them doing something much more similar to what an extension looks like in a snatch or a clean without them even knowing what a first pull, second pull or triple extension is. Mm. So this is this is what I'm doing when I'm teaching people from scratch is giving them simple things to think about that they already know how to do. And that way, that learning curve or the point where I can get them from mm. walking through a door, not knowing what a snatch is to doing a good looking snatch in 40 days happens that's a great let, yeah. keep let's keep going here i like that that's a really cool i've never heard anyone explain it like that let's let's break the triple extension down like that let's say you've you've now got me you i'm in the starting position right. you've taught me to jump kind of squeeze my glutes like walk me through all yeah. the way through okay, that okay let's do it so once we're in our set position i've got them set up feet normally again in terms of if i was telling someone where where do my feet go in my setup position I go, where would you go if you're going to jump as high as you can? Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to produce most vertical force. We want vertical force in snatch, clean up. There's where your foot position is. Like a vertical jump yeah. test, like you're reaching up. Of course, yeah. that's where you'd want your feet. So great. Now we want the bar to stay as close to the center of gravity as possible. So as close to the body. If the bar is away from us, it makes it very difficult for us to imply force on the bar. And therefore I say, okay, make sure the bar is touching your shins at the start. Because that's going to be over midfoot and as close to the body as possible. Mm -hmm. And then for me, it's about getting them to get the bar to mid thigh where we want to explode. Okay. Without it getting away from you. So I, I cue, keep the bar touching and push the floor away with the legs. Mm. Okay. So we're touching now until the bar gets to mid thigh. And then from here is where we want to explode. This is where we want change in speed as opposed to outright speed from the floor. So I'm very much like speed is not your friend. When you learn Olympic weightlifting, I'm like, let's go nice and slowly because unfortunately people go online, they go on to YouTube and they go, okay, snatch. And some Chinese guy pops up and he lifts so fast, you missed it in a blink. And they go, <laughs> that's what I need to do. I gotta go <laughs> no. Start yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's take it slow. Let's learn how to walk before we can run. So now the bar's touching. We're at mid thigh. And now they're thinking about jumping. As they jump, the bar still fires out the hip crease because they hit full extension. And now the bar's accelerating vertically. Great. Mm. Now what we need to do is to get into our receiving position. So my cue is catch. 
But prior to even talking about and teaching them this part, I've already taught them where their catch position is. So then it becomes the focus of thinking about touching, 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 jump and catch. And therefore they're thinking about the, they've got the full movement there happening already without thinking about triple extension, power position, and all of these confusing terms mm. that people get hung up on when they learn the process of Olympic weightlifting. Very, very yeah, that's cool. great. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. I'm going to yeah. make you shoot that so, YouTube video, by the way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just so you know. No, that's Absolutely. a good one. Yeah. So the catch position, are, are you going to have them start in, in a squat and like basically find out their depth and you know see what's most comfortable for them? So the, the whole process, if we were to rewind before we even get to set a position, would be to first of all, get them putting a bar over their head in right. the snatch grip. Now, when they're over in their snatch grip, for, for anyone listening, it's a, the wider wider position on the bar. We're looking for the bar to be over the crown of the head. I'm focused on external rotation and wrist sitting back, okay? And once someone can get into this position and they're happy, then the focus for me is once that bar's there, forget about it being over the head and just think about what the lower body's doing. Because if we get the lower body to take the majority of the load or the load to sink down to the lower body, the big muscles do the work as opposed to the small ones. Right. So we're locked out now, we're overhead. I'm like, okay, now let's begin squatting. And you just got to think about the exact same stimulus as you would do doing a back squat. And as soon as you put your brains in the legs, thinking about getting them to do the overhead squat then, again, it's 10 times easier because they already know how to do a back squat. Mm -hmm. mm. What, what, what are the most common athletes that come try to get coaching from you aside from Olympic lifters or people who use Olympic lifting in competition? Like, do you get lots of, you know, uh, I would assume CrossFitters would probably well, be besides CrossFitters. Okay. You get like, yeah, you get, do you ever do like football do you, players? Yeah. Do you or... get football players or soccer players? Or I think you guys call soccer players, football players. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So we rugby, rugby is a, sure. rugby is a big one um, that we get. We get um, a lot of athletes in, you know, sprinters, etc., that come in and they just want more time and more practice on their Olympic lifts. But there becomes, they're not so bothered about going, Going into full depth squat. They're like, I just want to learn how to power clean or I want to learn how to power snatch because I want to build explosive power. Mm. Whereas like regardless of that's what you want to do, I still think everyone should have an understanding of how to do the full range movement first, purely for the element that when you start to lift submaximally in a power clean, there's potential that you could get pushed in a little bit further than where your power clean would be. And that is where people start to get injured. So I'd always want them, regardless of whether they decide to use the power movements um, as their, their training, to have an understanding of the full movement. And again, here comes another problem in, in a, the learning of Olympic weight of thing, because people go, right, there's the clean, there's the power clean, they're two different movements. But essentially we're doing the power clean as an assistance to the full clean. Mm -hmm. So therefore the movement is very, it should be pretty much identical other than the point in which we're receiving the bar is much higher in a power clean mm. than a full clean, which is why when, you know, I'm snatching or when, when I'm power snatching or power cleaning, I think in my head, right, this is just a high clean or this is just a high power, a high snatch so that I'm focusing then on being faster into my receiving position. What are, what are mm -hmm. some of your, the, the, the best complementary exercises uh, for the Olympic lifts? Are there specific resistance training movements that you that you really like to have like people do? squats, overhead squats. Yeah, so. stuff like that. Yeah, so if we're, I think, um, a beginner or in your first six months to a year of Olympic weightlifting, I'd always say that your exercise selection is actually very small because we want to develop the movement, range mm -hmm. of movement. And if you're getting a beginner to do power snatch, power hang snatch, power hang snatch from blocks, there's all of these different, you know, movements that you need to master too much yeah too much so if we're talking about a basic program for a beginner sort of six six months to a year into their lifting we'd be looking at doing the full snatch and clean and jerk the full pulls so snatch pulls clean pulls which is for people listening an explosive um almost like an explosive deadlift and then we'd be going front squat back squat and then once we've got our four basic exercises then we'd add in variation of maybe the power snatch, the power clean. And then assistance exercises uh, alongside that, which I love, would be something like good mornings or practicing just the split jerk and the power jerk on their own. And therefore now we've got like roughly eight to 10 exercises that if you're training 
three times a week, you can make a quite good program out of just using maybe three exercises Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Now, do you ever do traditional, other traditional resistance training exercises like curls or, you know, a lateral or you know, a barbell row or anything like that? Yeah. And, you know, for, for a more competitive athlete or someone that does train five times a week or seven times a week and they've got time to throw in those extra assistance exercises, for sure, it does not hurt to do a little bit of a conventional bodybuilding to mm. ve develop strength and proprioception in other areas that you wouldn't normally go into during the actual lift, which again is great for injury prevention. However, I, I wouldn't necessarily throw in too much extra conditioning for a complete beginner because like I said, the focus sure. needs to be on the movement pattern. But for someone like myself I would maybe have like an hour a week where I'm just doing a more bodybuilding based session just purely to develop muscle around joints that are going to be under strain when we're lifting so um, I've got slightly hyper extending elbows for me doing extra bit of bodybuilding some barbell curls um, again some bench press to Protect gain it. some stability mm. over my shoulders beneficial great I'll put that in there but if you're an outright beginner, I wouldn't necessarily go into too much depth on that. So you've been you've been doing this now for 15 plus years, yeah. right? Uh, and we talk on the show a lot about our personal journeys in, in weightlifting. And along the way, there was many uh, paradigm shattering moments or aha moments in our career of like, oh shit, I've been doing this wrong forever. This is the better way to do it. Or things that we like, oh man, I know I've heard a million times that I should be changing the rep range up, but I've been stuck in this once I finally did that. Oh my God, I saw these gains. Can you recall in your 15 years of Olympic lifting those aha type moments or you know paradigm shattering moments for you where like things really started to accelerate? Yeah, so I think you know I do have to throw my mind back a little bit now, you know, 15 years into the sport, but I think one of the biggest things came for me when uh, I started competing internationally and um, I was traveling around the world competing at European World Championships and I was getting my butt kicked by all of these other athletes and I was watching what they were doing in training and I'd go back to, to my coach and be like, coach, why aren't we doing as much strength exercises as these guys are doing? They're squatting so much more regularly than me. They're spending a lot more time doing pulls. And when I was a beginner, or I'd say in my first three to four years of Olympic weightlifting, I didn't spend enough time once I had learned how to snatch and clean and jerk doing basic strength movements, which is why now for me, although my mobility is great, my technique's very good, my weakness as a weightlifter is my strength. That's the thing that holds me back. Oh, really? So I would say like that was a big moment for me in terms of thinking, right, on my focus as you get better once you master a consistent technique is to actually switch your focus as an elite level lifter from improving your technique and it actually becomes to making the more fo a bigger focus of your training around developing strength and explosive power so when i started shifting my training to more of the boring exercises the pulls and squats as opposed to doing so much snatch and clean and jerk i actually saw a, a big improvement because again, I was like, right, I need to snatch and clean and jerk three times a week to be able to, you know, get my movement pattern. And I was doing that and actually fatiguing and um, my body was breaking down from doing so much of the classic movements. And the minute I went to snatching once a week and clean and jerking once a week and making the majority of my training the strength based, there was there was a big shift then for me. Mm -hmm. Now, do you, uh, now where you're at now at your level, do you have to still do a lot of mobility work or does just your training take care of that for you right now? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And people always say it to me, they go, Sonny, where did you get your mobility from? But I started when I was 13 years old. So yeah. I was moving well and I have never had in my whole career any more than 10 days off from the gym. So wow. therefore I'm consistently going through those ranges and I've maintained a lot of my flexibility from when I was younger. However, I will still twice a week be doing either overhead squats, snatch balance to make sure I'm strengthening and mobilizing the range that I'm going into in in the snatch and in the cleans. But people don't necessarily see so much of that because they're like, well, he's doing overhead squats. That's not mm -hmm. mobility. But in my mind, it is because I'm going specifically putting my feet in the receiving position for my snatch, for example, and I'm taking a slight pause in the bottom position to stretch out and to mobilize under load before standing up. 
Oh, right. no, yeah. Now, how often are you chasing PRs as a professional? So I, I do this thing called Big Friday. So um, Big Friday for me, um, as a competitive weightlifter or someone who's got a big training history in the sport, the regularity of PBs <laughs> is very small. You know, I haven't done a snatch PB in like maybe two years, but I'm training every day towards it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it can be extremely demoralizing. Typically you save them for competitions now. <laughs> Typically you'd save yeah. them for competitions. So for me, by having like what I call my big Friday, I'll have one day a week where I'll go submaximally in a exercise and not necessarily for a one RM, but maybe for a two RM or a three RM. And that way it helps you stay, I guess, excited through training to, that you're working towards mm. PB is not necessarily, and this is the best snatch I've done in my life. It's a daily max mm -hmm. in hang snatch, or it's a daily max in squat triple. So that way, like for me, I'm having at least one time a week where I'm getting the opportunity to push myself submaximally. Mm. Most people are motivated uh, for fitness by aesthetic goals, right? They want to change the way they look. What are the body parts or parts of the body that Olympic lifting really trains well? Like if somebody who's listening right now, fitness fanatic, never really considered Olympic lifting, you know, how would you sell that to them? What are the what are the parts of their body they can expect to see better development from or changes in through doing or incorporating Olympic lifting? Yeah, uh, okay, so definitely legs. <laughs> I've got little tree trunk legs. When people look at me, they go, I expected you to be so much bigger knowing like, <laughs> knowing how much you lift. But I'd say definitely legs, posterior chain, um, back, glutes, the development definitely in these areas, traps from pools, all of they're getting an absolute beasting when we're Olympic weightlifting. Um, but not only that, I'd say actually having being able to move well under load in general when you're Olympic weightlifting is a very attractive um, skill. Like I said, I can go up and pick up bodybuilding, powerlifting, and jump straight into doing those drills, having already learned how to do Olympic weightlifting, whereas it doesn't work the other way around. Mm. So I think that's a very attractive thing in Olympic weightlifting is the fact that you will then liken yourself much better into other um, sports or any other training styles, having known how to do Olympic weightlifting. I think that's yeah. a great point. That you, I think Olympic lifting in general carries over to almost all sports yep. a little bit yep. where mm -hmm. all those other ones has little to no carry over yeah, exactly. to any sports. Yeah, it's like full kinetic chain. I mean, just, just you training explosively like that probably protects you if you were to go pick up and play basketball for the day or go play football where – you know, a guy like me who who trains more strength bodybuilding train most of the time, and boy, am I at risk. I get on the beach, I go run, I pull yep. a hammy almost every time, you know. So. You've got general health down, but in terms of functional performance, Olympic lifters always surprise the hell out of me. I mean, I've, I've had them uh, train in some of my gyms and, you know, they don't play sports, they don't play basketball, just, but then you watch them jump or do something athletic and you're like, holy Toledo. And I know they've done studies on, because we all have a, a particular capacity for strength, but our, our body limits us to, to protect our body. So like the average person might be able to only generate maybe 50% of the real force that they could generate. Maybe if they're stressed or scared or really, really angry, they'd be able to tap into something like 60% or whatever. Olympic lifters consistently uh, test the highest. Like you guys can tap into most of the strength that your body has, which is why I think sometimes when you see an Olympic lifter lift a crazy amount of weight, it doesn't always match up with the way they look. Like you say, well, he's muscular, but geez, he's not nearly as big as a bodybuilder, but he's lifting like three times as much, you know, as much weight. And it's also getting everything to work in unison too. Like in comparison, that's why I was alluding to like a bodybuilder versus like, or like a power lifter. Like it must be somewhat difficult if they're trying to, you know, muscle it up with, you know, trying to use their upper body a lot, uh, pulling off the ground versus, you know, just getting that initial yeah. force, uh, all into the ground through your feet and then using your legs primarily to drive it. Yeah. And I think that again, that's the, when we were speaking earlier about having a body bodybuilder or a powerlifter come into Olympic where they go, yeah, I'm strong. This is going to be no problem, <laughs> but it's getting them to get the right muscles working, you know, over the, over the little muscles. And that's what I'm saying with the cues. And when I'm teaching people from basics, the focus is on, you know, getting all the big muscles to do the work and getting that acceleration from from the legs as opposed to you know trying to use the upper body but what will happen is with a someone like that who starts doing olympic weightlifting they'll get to that point where they're submaximally 
you know, about to struggle, say when I was teaching bass, he gets to 120, he goes, right now I just want to use my upper body. But that's where the moment has to stop in terms of where the weights that you're training to. So mm -hmm. if you get to a hundred and you start muscling it up, but you can, stop can do more. 110, 120, mm -hmm. you need to stop at that point so that the movement is the thing that the technique and how well you're moving is the thing that prevents you from going heavier as opposed to your strength being the limiting yeah. factor. What are some uh, of the most common injuries uh, involved with this? Um, injuries in Olympic weightlifting. Well, you see, I think from a, an, a, an elite point, I'd say dislocated shoulders, elbows are very common. Knee injuries um, in Olympic weightlifting are huge. But again, for me, that becomes, I think, from repetition, squatting repetitions. And, you know, I've in the past had, I've had torn both my elbows. I've got three dehydrated discs, two disc bulges, one fused vertebrae, and bone growth over a disc bulge. I've had uh, issues with both my knees in the past, um, with inflammation problems, etc., and that just became that came from too much repetition. And as I've got older, I know I'm not old, but in my training years, I am. I'm 25 now, training 15 years in Olympic way of thing. What I've had to do is reduce the amount of times I'm going through a full range. Mm. So therefore, like I said, now where I was squatting seven times a week when I was training at my hardest in Olympic weight of thing to now I only squat three times a week. Um, it means that I've managed to maintain, um, not be get so injured or have any of these issues and pain problems because I'm not going through the full range of motion as much as I used to before. Mm -hmm. Let's say average person listening right now works out fitness fanatic. They want to incorporate an element of, Olympic lifting, how would you suggest that they proceed? Do they pick, which exercise do they pick? Or how should they start? Where do they program that into their normal workout? Yeah, so I'd say um, the snatch is the, the hardest one to do, but I'd say for a beginner, that would still be where I'd get them to start. You know, it's like when you learn to drive a car and they teach you in a manual first before you learn to do an automatic. They do in England anyway, even though the automatic's easier to drive. That's how I learned. Um, yeah. Whereas same thing has to happen with the Olympic weight of thing, you know, so we teach them how to snatch first. Um, so the first few movements that I would do in, in my beginner program or my learn to lift would get them to develop the overhead squat. So, so practice with like a broomstick or something Practice like that? with a broomstick going through that range with an overhead squat and then doing some snatch balance. And then I think, you know, that they have to go straight into learning how to do the full movements because if it's something that they want to do, and this is one of the biggest problems with CrossFit, you want to get into a class where you're, you know, cycling the barbell and you go, it's a much quicker route if you do a power clean or if you do uh, a power snatch. However, that's going to bite you in the bum six months down the line when you go, I really love weightlifting. I want to continue to do it. But you've got so strong catching it in the power that you don't want to sit down and you resort back to that, which oh, is, which is wild. Uh, I totally understand your question. The easiest way to get into it or the movements they need to start doing, but you have to go all in to begin with and learn the full range first, regardless of if you decide further down the line to use simpler formats of the Olympic lifts to progress your training. All right. So another mm. question with that, let's say, okay, I'm listening to the podcast. All right, cool. I'm going to practice. I'm going to get a broomstick. I'm going to practice overhead, uh, you know, squats or snatch. Do I do that at the beginning of my workout or do I do it at the end when I finished uh, working everything? Yeah, I, I love this question. And it comes back as well to, you know, the mobility aspect of Olympic weight. If they're like, should I mobilize or should I practice my movements before or after? Because people are like, oh, you shouldn't stretch before training. Sure. But for me, if you can't get in the positions that are required of you in the snatch, in the clean and jerk, then you must mobilize first to gain improvement in those ranges before you even think about loading. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're least fatigued, and it's the same way as we structure any training program, if your goal is to learn how to learn how to do the Olympic movements over the next six months, don't do them right at the end of the session where you're already knackered from bodybuilding, <laughs> yeah. dinner, dinner's on the dinner table in 10 minutes and you're like, I'll just do a little bit before I head off. Make it the priority of your training session. And I think regardless of whether you're talking about weightlifting, whether you're talking about powerlifting or you know, you're trying to get more ripped, if that's your goal, prioritize it in the way that you program your training. Spend 20 minutes at the start of your session when you're at your freshest when you've got your biggest attention span and then practice it then 
and then do the uh, less important stuff afterwards. Now, the reality is, uh, you know, an overhead squat or snatch position with the broomstick, as long as you don't have any prior injuries, or whatever, is actually generally a whole body mobility movement. I mean, it gets the hips, gets the thoracic, um, mm -hmm. gets everything kind of to fire. So would you say, okay, go into the workout, do some mobility movements first, then do what you're saying and practice it with like slow. Do you want them to do it slowly with good tension and good form? Or do you want them to go through and try and do it fast? Yeah. So I'd be starting off with 20 minutes of mobility. So this is mobilizing the joints and body parts that we need to be mobile and have a range through first before we touch the barbell. <clears throat> Once I've done my mobilizing, I would then maybe, instead of a broomstick, I'd pick up maybe a 10 kilo bar or a technique bar, just so we've got that sure. element of resistance. And then I'd beginning like, for example, today, we're going to work on five sets of five overhead squat, with the bar, super light, That's get it. going through the range. The next exercise we may be doing would be starting to practice the process of the setup and the first pull and getting them to do the transition of the jump. So you're breaking down the elements, okay, before trying to put the full movement together because that's where people go, they look and see the snatch and go, oh, this is going to be very difficult to, to actually comprehend how I'm going to put all this together. Whereas you go, learn how to overhead squat, learn how to do the first pull, learn the transition through the middle, and then we sew it together in six weeks' time, then you're laughing. Mm. I have a question for you. So I right. watch videos on uh, with Olympic lifters, and, and they'll squat, just a straight-up barbell squat, back squat, and the amount of weight that, that these top lifters can squat is literally insane. But what really trips me out is you guys are not allowed to use uh, like powerlifting weight belt, right? You can't use that. How do you brace your core – is there a technique or a way you brace your core to be able to handle that much load when you're doing a lift? And it, 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 I know it's different from wearing a belt, right? It's a different type of brace. What's the, what does that look like? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question. It's something that for me, you see the majority of people, especially that won't be weightlifters, the mm -hmm. way that they squat is very different to the way that a, a weightlifter squat. And I've been lucky enough to be training with Australian strength coach, who's a specialist in powerlifting, coaches Thor. And um, the way in which he squats is so much slower than, than how I squat. He squats with a low bar because it requires less mobility. And the way in which, you know, he's squatting, he's thinking, again, really slow um, throughout the full range of the motion. Whereas when we're Olympic weightlifting, we're almost catching that bounce, <laughs> catching that bounce at the bottom and using that momentum stretch reflex to help us drive up and out the hole. Now, as though that's great in terms of developing um, speed through the explosive part of the lift, I'd say in terms of the way that I'm bracing when I'm Olympic weightlifting is I'm not using my belt when I'm building up to sort of 80%, I'd say. And I think about bracing in the same way as if I was, if someone was to stick my head underwater, and that's what I always say to people, take a nice deep breath and kind of push against your abs as opposed to through your lungs, Okay, when I'm, when I'm setting and that way, then I keep the tension through my trunk as opposed to necessarily in my lungs. And that's what I'm pushing out against. But you'll see like, and what so are I'm, you drawing the, the core in and tight or are you pushing it out? Like, what does that feel like? Yeah, I'm drawing it in. So I'm like yeah. crunching in the same way as I would do. When so different from when you use a power lifting weight belt. This is something that, you know, a long time ago, there was this whole debate whether or not you're, you're, you're not, your core is less active or more active when you wear a belt. Then they did imaging on the core and they said, oh, look, you're, you're, you're still activating the core muscles. So wearing a belt is perfectly fine. And I would tell people it's a different recruitment pattern. When you wear a belt, you're pushing out against the belt. That's the exact opposite of what it's you want to do, do that, when yeah. you don't wear a belt, right? So yeah. if you learn one, you learn how to squat with a belt on, then you take it off. It's gonna, you have to like relearn how to brace your core. Yeah, it's, it is very different. It's something I've not spent a lot of time, time thinking about. But yeah, in the way that, you know, I've noticed – in terms of where people wear their belt as well. Mm. Some people wear their belt so much higher than, than others. The guys with bellies. Yeah, <laughs> so with powerlifters. But I'm pushing, yeah, bracing out against my belt when I'm, when I'm squatting. Mm -hmm. And then without my belt, you'll see it looks like I'm almost like pregnant almost sometimes when, I, when mm. I'm lifting. Because mm, you're bracing it in. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's uh, very informative. And I do think that explosive type movements are an essential part of training. I just think that they should be um, handled uh, appropriately. I think you need to be very smart when you go into them because 
if you don't do them right, you can definitely hurt yourself. And I don't think you should train them crazy to fatigue. I, I think you need to be very respectful. But if you can do that and you're patient, you, they reap tremendous benefits. Well, I, one of the things that I've fallen in love with, and I, and I wish I've had, had somebody like yourself who, who's, who I could go through Olympic lifts and actually get good at it because by no means can I do it very well. But I have worked a lot on my mobility. I, I lacked ankle mobility. I lacked hip mobility. I lacked thoracic mobility. And I spent the last... And this was, you know, during bodybuilding times for me, I had lost all that and become so focused on my aesthetics that I had lost mobility in all these areas. And then when I tried to do a deep squat, do any of those things, it was just impossible. So it took almost a year for me to regain all of that back. And now what I have found is I don't have to do all the, you know, monotonous type of movements to get to the point where I have the mobility uh, all I have to do is do like an overhead squat. If I just make sure that I always keep an overhead squat in my routine, that promotes good thoracic mobility, that promotes good hip mobility, that promotes good ankle mobility. Yeah. And it's like, 100%. I don't have to really address all these things as long as I make sure to integrate. That's my favorite part. And where I see tons of value for the average person listening to learn Olympic lifting, because if you can get to a point where you can do it, and then you, and even if you don't care to go compete one day or be great in the sport, if you can just keep an element of it mm -hmm. in your in your regular routine, uh, what it requires mobility wise, I just see the the benefits of that for joint uh, health sure. longevity. Yeah, oh, and, and 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 this is it for me, and this is like the the main point for me being that weightlifting can be accessible for anyone, the average person. They don't need to look at it as a point of a daunting point that I'm going to compete one day and oh. I'm not sure whether I can pick up the sport. Broken down, once you've got your range of mobility, like you said, can be used in every every person's training 100%, even if it's just elements of the exercises. And, you know, that's kind of m my role, I guess, in the fitness industry is to show people that it is fun and inaccessible for everyone as long as you can learn how to move well first. So I've thought differently about it too, in terms of like training fast twitch muscles. And as we age, like that's one of the first things to, yeah. to, to go. And so in order to incorporate that uh, in your training routine, I find that even more valuable looking into the future. Yeah. I, the, the, the one, some of the biggest lessons I learned from Olympic lifters, and I don't have a lot of experience with Olympic lifting at all, but I did, uh, a lot of study and observation, mainly because some of the best resistance training studies you'll find, scientific studies are done on Olympic lifters. They've been yeah. studied for a very, very long time. This, the, some of the studies coming that came out of the Soviet Union were just phenomenal. It's a, it's a, it's an Olympic sport, so you had a lot of people interested in it. Very le far less studies done on bodybuilding or powerlifting or other forms of resistance training. And one of the main things I learned from Olympic lifting was to treat uh, resistance training as practice. This is a very, very different understanding than what I was brought up understanding about resistance training where I was reading bodybuilding magazines. It was all about feeling the burn, feeling the pump, fatigue, yeah. going to failure, getting fatigued. Then when I started learning about Olympic lifters, they would practice the movements or like, like, like practicing any other skill. And I applied that to my traditional exercises where uh, you know, some days I do train very intensely, but many times I go to the gym and I'm in there to practice all these exercises and my gains went through the roof. My, my mobility went through the roof. My, I, I built more muscle, burnt yeah. more body fat. And I applied that as a, as a personal trainer. That's one of the biggest compliments I, I, I can give Olympic lifting is you guys really understand the science of training and technique better. I'd say than most uh, forms of resistance training. So I, I really like that approach and the way you think about Olympic way of thing is practicing a movement. And, you know, with, um, with anything in terms of like when I was I was training with Matt Fraser um, last year and I was just getting into to CrossFit at the time and starting to learn the things and he said to me, he said, Sonny, you're not allowed to do a workout or put an exercise in a workout that you can't do well under fatigue. So in terms of move well through mm -hmm. first before I did that movement under fatigue. And that meant initially, even though I could do every movement in CrossFit, I was making my workups out of doing like air squats, press-ups, you know, <laughs> very simple movements. And I was still getting the required stimulus of uh, a sweaty workout and my heart rate going, but I could only then put in, so then I'd do that at the end of my session. The first part of my session would be like, right, I'm going to practice my pull-ups and master the movement of the pull-up. And once I've 
mastered it, only then does it become an exercise that goes into something that I'm going to be doing in a workout or under fatigue. And, and the I irony of all of that is because most people listening are like, like I just want to look good. I just want to build muscle. I just want to yeah. get lean. You get better results that way. Like I've 100%. had clients. Oh, I've got I've had clients who are like, I I, I want to get better at pull ups. And I say, well, what are you doing? Well, I, I you know I do pull ups once a week, and I go to failure, and I say, okay, stop doing that. Here's what I want you to do: put up a pull up bar in your house, and I want you to practice one pull up. You know, every few hours or whatever, every day, just every day, you walk by, yeah. do one pull up, just practice it, and then watch what happens. Within like a week or two, they've got you know thirty percent more reps than they had before, and they had better gains from practicing. And this is funny. We treat every other sport this way. It's like you're teaching a kid how to you know, play soccer. You don't say go play soccer to failure. You practice the technique over and over again to get really good at it. And you guys do that phenomenally. So anyway, thanks for coming on the show, man. That's yeah, excellent. a great point yeah. to finish on. Thank yeah, you very yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been yeah. very informative. And, I, and, and you know, I'd say the one point that we, when, when it comes to resistance training that we don't like to go into details on is Olympic lifting because we have so much respect for uh, the skill and technique that's involved. So I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Excited Cheers, for you on the YouTube now, man. Right on. Yeah. Let's do it.